Hi, my name is Johnny Nava, and the song that you just heard was What Me Worry by Portugal Man. And it is the perfect introduction to this episode because today I'm talking to the lead singer, guitarist, and songwriter for one of my favorite bands on planet Earth, Portugal Man. Now, I could spend all day talking about this conversation, what it meant to me, how it's one of my favorite conversations I've ever had and how much I've learned from it. But I do feel compelled to just give John a compliment about how cool he is. Now, when I say cool, I don't mean it in the definition that I think I grew up with. I feel like it used to be that being cool meant that you were a bit rebellious, maybe a little bit dangerous, that you had this, I don't give a fuck attitude and that you had maybe some type of subdued charisma that attracted people to you. I don't mean it like that because I think that times have changed a bit. I feel like being cool now is more about being talented, and confident, but still remaining humble and having no ego. And that is exactly the kind of person that John is. I mean, you'll notice at the start of the interview, I tried giving John a compliment and he immediately diverts all the praise to everyone else but himself. And not only that, he's also doing some incredible work through the PTM Foundation that is designed to build communities and raise awareness around critical issues like human rights, environmental issues, disability issues, and more specifically, raising awareness around the issues that indigenous people are struggling with and giving them opportunities to tell their stories. And all that to me is the very definition of cool. In this conversation, we discuss what life was like for John growing up in Alaska with his larger than life parents. We discuss the creative process and what's next for Portugal, a man. But John also has some incredible advice when it comes to not only recognizing, but accepting and owning your anxiety that I think is just brilliant. Words can't really describe how excited I am to share this conversation with you. So with all that being said, here is my conversation with John Gorley from Portugal, the man. John, so happy to have you on the podcast. I mean, I've been listening to Portugal the man since I was in high school, so. This is a really a bucket list thing for me and truly a blessing that you're on. I just wanted to start things off by, by just letting you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to see you, Portugal and Man, and Some Little and Glass Animals at Red Rocks. And my brother, who initially reached out to you, we went together. It was just us two. We flew out to Colorado to see it. And, dude, I just want to let you know, like, we we go to concerts all the time. We're, like, kind of concert junkies. But to this day... We are both like, yeah, that was probably the best concert we've been to. So really appreciate you for putting that show on. Yeah, well, thanks to Glass Animals for giving us the hardest act to follow. <laughs> I guess. It's so funny. We were just talking about this show the other day. Kyle's girlfriend was at that show too, and they hadn't met yet. She was just kind of randomly mm -hmm. at the show. It's, Sun Little is so amazing. Like, what Dude, a voice. his voice is insane. Yeah, I mean, it's just so good. <laughs> and yeah, that, that show was really fun. The Glass Animals were really cool. And it's, I mean, it's just fun watching bands, like, grow so much. They've obviously, like, they, I mean, far surpassed us. But yeah, it was just a fun show. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I mean, I just, I feel like it's hard to put on a bad show in that venue. But, I mean, from Glass Animals running into the crowd and then to ending with Hey Jude, I mean, it was just like a perfect evening. So really appreciate you putting that one on. But I wanted to just maybe start by by just, you know, kind of asking you a little bit about yourself. I mean, obviously I'm pretty familiar with you in Portugal, the man your work, but I thought maybe a good place to start would be if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. And I, I found learning a little bit more about where you came from in Alaska to be really interesting. So maybe if you could just introduce yourself and we can go from there. Yeah. So yeah, I guess I'm John Gorley playing Portugal, the man. I grew up in Alaska. We started out in this little cabin. My dad's way more interesting than I think I am. His coming to Alaska, my mom and dad both, they both moved from this town called Morrisville in upstate New York. Both come from the same town, didn't know each other growing up but they were kind of both a part of this back to the land movement. 
which is like a movement in the 60s, like go go out to the land, figure out where we come from, just go, go and live. And, and Alaska was on that list, I guess, for a lot of people from that town, especially. But I guess my dad moved up in 70, 71, right out of high school, went straight to the mountains of Chase outside of Talkeetna. And the plan was him and his friends were going to go up and they were going to all go out to these mountains and they were going to live for three years off the land and then come and meet back up in Talkeetna after that three years. My dad came out after three years living in the mountains and these stories are really amazing. You have to get them from my dad, but running into bears, like bears sticking their head in his cabin and everything <laughs> that he, he overcame being out there. It's, it's, it's just so interesting, but he came back to Talkeetna after that three years and nobody was there. <laughs> His friends nobody <laughs> saved the woods for the three years. So he came out uh, alone and worked on a potato farm for a while, worked in, I mean, what they called the mental institute back then for a while. And just the, it's just kind of a wild journey to, to finding my mom and having us kids. And uh, yeah, he just, that journey continued after we were born. He, he, he worked his way up and ended up creating this construction company. He was building homes in, in Wasilla. We actually, he actually built the house that our bass player grew up in, which oh, was whoa. so That's crazy. funny like, <laughs> pulling up on the house. I mean, this is so long ago now, but at the beginning of the band, pulling up at my friend Zach's house, my dad saying, oh, I, I built this house. I built the house as actually yeah he he used to do this thing where our family has never really cared about money or like really material things a whole lot and it, it he would do things for trade so growing up he would he would build a shed and he'd say oh like that's that's a cool dune buggy can i trade for that he was always trading down too the, the dune buggy <laughs> is uh -huh. much less than the shed and he, but he would always be like, oh, if you don't have the money, like, let's, let's just trade for that. Oh, you need a house? That's a cool boat. Like, I'll trade for that boat. And then eventually he would trade the boat for something smaller and something smaller. And then you'd kind of end up at the end of the day being like, well, that was some fun. Like, we had a lot of fun. But <laughs> he, he would always end up back, back at zero. What, one of the things that he picked up along the way was he had built a shed for one of the founders of the Iditarod, Joe Reddington Sr., and it, while he was building it, he's looking around saying, wow, this is really interesting. You're, you're a dog musher. Like you, if he found it, the idea ride, he said, you know, I'll trade, I'll, I'll trade my work for these dogs or like a dog team. And Joe kind of taught him everything he knew, got my dad introduced to that. And my dad took us out to this cabin and we just lived out there in the icy lake outside of Takina. We lived out there for a few years while he was learning how to train dogs and getting into, <laughs> into mushing. And we just lived in this one room cabin, taking baths in this tin tub, you know, it was, it was very like boil water to, to take a shower, you know, take a <laughs> bath. It, it yeah. was, it was a really cool upbringing and, and that, lasted until I left Alaska. We've moved around a lot. We lived outside of Denali for probably four years altogether, lived in Fairbanks, just moved around the state around mushing and the Yukon quest. And he was always about the, the treatment of the animals because when you're out there, like the, the dogs really love, like they just love doing this. It's, it's, it's a really amazing relationship that you have. And it's, I mean, he, he ended up being race marshal on the Iditarod you know, at, like a few years as well, just looking after the treatment of, of the dogs and the dogs were happy and healthy. And I mean, it, it, it was just fun tra traveling around. I think that's, that's what awesome. sparked a lot of my, I guess, will to travel myself and kind of knowing that we needed nothing but each other along the way is the thing that made me want to do it. But to be perfectly honest, I never pictured myself actually doing it. I, like I wanted to see these places. I wanted to, to 
to go to New York and Texas and, and these spots. I never saw myself leaving the country. I never saw myself getting out further than that. I was a very shy kid growing up. I mean, you can imagine. I grew up in right. cabins and just was not around pop culture. Like, we didn't really have TV. We didn't have power until I was, I mean, until I left Alaska. I, I grew up with a generator. And for listeners, the Iditarod is a dog sledding race across Alaska, right? Yeah, it's 1,049 miles yeah. across Alaska. It's, it's like insane. 10 days, 14 days. Back, I mean, back then it was, it took a lot longer. I mean, weather has changed so much that it's, it's a pretty fast race at this point, but it's still just like brutal. Like you go out there, you're just up all night. And I mean, his stories about just the hallucinations when you're up all night like that, like just rolling <laughs> dogs and seeing like little people come out of the woods to kind of scare the dogs along the way. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty wild. I feel like I might need to get him on the podcast at some point. He sounds like a fascinating character. Yeah. And that's what the band is named after, right? Uh, Port I read that Portugal and Man was supposed to be a book about your dad. Yeah. I, and he kind of adopted it as a, a yeah, name. Yeah, I always wanted to write this, like, th just this idea that, like, it, it's, like, bigger than life. It's so, when you know him, I mean, I grew up with him. Both of my parents are like this. Like, they're both just, like, my mom's a been a firefighter, EMT, like, dive rescue in Alaska. Like she's doing all this stuff. She is one of the toughest people I have ever known. They're, they're both just, it's in them. And so then for you, I mean, I, I'm kind of curious to, to hear a little bit more about your story. Cause you, you talk about growing up in one cabin, being shy. How did your interest in music get started? And then how did that lead to forming the band? <laughs> so, I mean, all we had was each other growing up. My parents, Loved music so much. My dad. The last thing my dad did before moving to Alaska was go to Woodstock. You know, he w he was mm. at Woodstock and sixty nine. Yeah, it'd be amazing if it was ninety nine. My dad was at Woodstock ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> Limp Biscuit. That was DMX. Yeah, um, <laughs> he was in the crowd. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was vibing. Um, yeah, it was just a musical family, and we had this really great station you could kind of pick it up everywhere it was always clear it was 97.3 and we would listen to all these radio it was just like the coolest it was like the best deals it was the be like elvis roy orbison motown is the supremes it was deep cuts it was the hits from that era i just kind of grew up on this like Motown and we we would just sing it I mean I, I know the influences that it's had on me now right now especially like when it comes to the, the more you play music I, I think you realize how much those formative years like those those years as a little kid listening to that stuff gives you your pocket and your rhythm and your feel for things like it's it's so natural for me to fall on the back of a beat because that's all I knew growing up like it, it was the, the guitar should land here piano should land here the beat should have this swing to it like it should it, it's all feel it's all pocket but yeah we, were, we had listened to this music growing up and sing along with all these songs driving out just I mean just driving through Denali and just the miles and miles of swamp spruce and tundra and eating blueberries <laughs> everywhere we went because it just grows all over the tundra blueberries and blackberries all of those things together it's it's so sensory like you're so like you're you're picking up on all these like it's it's nature it's a taste it's a smell it's one of my favorite things about music is the way it, it triggers memories any of those like sensory memories, like a smell can have a sound that comes along with it, whether it's the sound of a kitchen or it's sound of the pots and pans, you know, it, it can mm. your memories. And I, I always just love that about me. For sure. Is remembering that summer, remembering that spring, remembering that hockey game where I heard Champagne Supernova for the first time. 
And I went, <laughs> yeah. oh my God, they're still making great music. I didn't realize, like, I thought the Beatles had done it. I didn't realize that you could just mm -hmm. write the Beatles still and and make it sound great. <laughs> and that's, that's yeah. what it was. Like, Oasis to me was, you're doing the Beatles o almost better than the Beatles in, in a lot of ways. It's this, like, progression. And it was amazing watching them just take these parts of things that I grew up with and recreate it in a way that was so new and so fresh. Hearing hockey was fun for me because you, you would hear like silver chair and you'd go, mm -hmm. wow, this kid is like two years, three years older than me. Like, like they were so young when they started. I mean, they were barely older than us. They were like high school kids and we were, not high right. school kids. <laughs> so those are, things, <laughs> but they're still kids. Just hear, hearing all these things. I remember hearing Wu Tang for the first time, and that that was on the box. And I don't know who had the box growing up. I, I think it might have been an East Coast thing. I I don't know, but we would every morning before school we would watch these like music videos. It was like one of the few channels we got that came in and a box like i would watch the box and i remember seeing method man and and going wow this is there's something about hearing that that it was just all the motown stuff i grew up on it was it brought back those memories it was it was wow like i might not know this song that riz is sampling but i definitely know that tone and i know that mic i know that pocket and it made it feel nostalgic. And then all these friends jumping on the track together, it was like, man, that's all I want. It's like, I just want to get mm. a bunch of my friends and jump on tracks and like do this like fun thing where you're trading verses and you're trading parts. It was just so creative and so fresh. And they were taking things I knew. All, all of these bands, by the way, like, Nirvana, Oasis, and Wu-Tang, like, it's it's a, an eclectic group for sure, but they're all doing the same thing, which is they're progressing music. They're taking a bit of what they heard and creating their own thing with it. And there's no, like, lawsuits involved. <laughs> and, like, I mean, there are. <laughs> yeah. are them. Yeah. But it shouldn't be like that. That's what music is meant to be. Like the blues is like, I totally like agree. Hey, I got a story and it's going to be these three chords and they're the same three chords <laughs> single time. And it's just my story over top of these three chords. You don't own those chords. Dylan doesn't own those chords. Nobody yeah. owns those chords. Dylan especially doesn't own those chords, <laughs> you know, and, and, and be, being like cognizant of where the, all of this is coming from i think is a really important thing and that just takes me to like what creativity is and there's like this magic in the room when you're making music that comes from all these memories and the, that like the sensory memories it should be cinematic it should be like big and also like coming from your soul you need to be open to it you need to like let it come in let it flow through you and not be like yeah, I'm original. I made all of this myself. Bowie would never say yeah. that. Like people who you'd say like I'm oh, totally <laughs> original, like oh, no, he's not. Like he would never say that. That's so silly. Yeah. To think that you, like, it just came from you. Like no, it's, it's the generation before me and the generation before them. And like, watching the way music gets passed down, is the most interesting thing to me. I I I loved growing up in that cabin and listening to that music and thinking, oh, the greatest music has already been made. <laughs> like, Dan Ross, yeah. like, she already sang it. Like, it's already that good. Like, Aretha Franklin, like, you can't get better than that. And <laughs> that, that might be true. But that's why somebody takes it and they go, yeah, but this is how I sound when I do my thing. Having the confidence yeah. to do that is, is that's probably the, the harder thing, to, the more difficult thing to find. Yeah. Like wanting to do it for other people, 
is something that I think is strange. I don't know if you've. <laughs> no, I, I get that. It's like sometimes when you, you discover your own voice by trying to impersonate somebody else's, then failing, and then that's like, oh, well, I don't sound anything like David Bowie or Nirvana, but I kind of brought a lot of the same chords, and it came out something different. Which it should. You, you know, there's a funny thing yeah. that happens in <laughs> practice with me where, I mean, like a lot of people I work with, it's just say this stuff. You, you're not referencing like when I'm like. Hey, it should sound like Black Sabbath. I don't even know what Black Sabbath sounds like. Like what? I don't know what that is. <laughs> like, I just know <laughs> yeah. the image in my head and what it feels like to me. And I've heard it, you know, like I've passed by it. It's, it's in my memory. I've listened to Black Sabbath, of course, but when you're saying like, it should be like that, it's the emotion. It's like the feeling it gives you. There's something just along the way, like conversations that have come up recently about like influence and like, hey, I, I helped you find this song by showing you this other song. I helped you find your, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think it's like a really valid point when somebody's like, oh, I gave you that playlist and it got you you going and it made you like want to make a song like that. There's There's some truth to that, but I think really at the end of the day, like what, I latch onto is the emotion that you have when you show me something. Like if you're like, mm -hmm. if you're stoked and you're just like, you got to check out this thing. I might not like the music, you know, like I might not be hearing the same thing that you're hearing. I shouldn't say I don't like it. I might not be hearing it the way you hear it. But mm -hmm. what I am feeling is that emotion that you have when you hear it. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. And that's, that's all I care about when people are making music is that it's like honest and makes them feel a certain way. I mean, that's, that's why I make music is the, the feeling. It's not, yeah. it's not the other connection. Story. Yeah. I'm glad that you said that because you told this story and I, I may butcher it, but I don't want to make you retell it about you when you were, you went out to see dead mouse for prior to evil friends. And he was like, I don't really want to make a rock album right now. I kind of, I kind of get my plate full. But then he was like, what kind of album do you want to make after hanging out? And you were just like the best album. And I feel like that's like the perfect philosophy with anything creative. It's just like, why do it if it's not going to be the best that you can possibly do? And I, I feel like that story has been living in my head rent free since I heard it. It's been kind of a great compass for me, but I'm curious to hear from you what keeps you or what motivates you to continue making music besides just that connection or, or just that energy that you're sharing with other people? Damn, dude, that's, I mean, that is a good question. So it was, it was Danger Mouse. It was, it was going over to Danger Mouse's house. <laughs> I mean, I remember it so well. It's funny the things you say, like when you're younger and you're just like full of this confidence and yeah, no, I think you should make the best album. Every single time you go in, like, no, I want to make the best album. I don't want to go in and just I'm, I'm not just trying to like get something off my chest or anything like i want to make an album that i want to hear and i want to like play it and listen to it and and feel like there was a reason it, it happened i mean i think the albums came out so so great personally like Agreed. it's it's exactly what it needed to be at that time there was a lot of things i was mm -hmm. struggling with anxiety wise during that period and it was questioning whether like yeah is this my group is this my my friends like do i want to keep doing this i mean evil friends is like it kind of sums it all up like it starts out with plastic soldiers like i can't keep my head up you know i want to stay with my friends mm -hmm. but i can't keep my head up i mean that's that's been mm -hmm. me, like since the beginning of this band is I don't really know what I'm doing here, but I, I want to keep doing it. And I, I love being a part of this process as a group and like having friends around and it's whatever that is, it's just, it's playing music with your friends. That's mm -hmm. what I like to do. Right now that, and I, I agree that the album came out really well. I feel like evil friends was like the one where I was like trying to get my friends to listen to, to Portugal, the man. And then they were like, Hey, have you checked out like this band, Portugal, man, they put out this great album, you were friends. And I was like, guys, come on. Like, I've been, <laughs> I, I've been, I've been telling you guys this for years.
Hello fellow mortals. Wanted to take some time to highlight some of the work that the PTM Foundation has been doing in their community. Now, obviously, Portugal the Man has been making some of the best music around for years now, but what many people don't know is that a couple years ago, they started the PTM Foundation in order to make a more direct impact. Now to be clear, the band has been involved in political activism for years now. It's in their lyrics, but they've also dedicated their time and resources to playing events, rallies, nonprofit fundraisers for things that they feel are important. However, what they've built with the PTM Foundation is very unique and important. And so I felt like I should take some time out of the show to tell you a little bit about it. The PTM Foundation is focused on building nonpartisan awareness towards important issues like climate change, human rights, disability rights, all through music, art, and most importantly, education. One of the focuses of the PTM Foundation right now is to give a voice to indigenous people. Imperialism has left an ocean of human rights violation in its history, especially in America. And so one of the issues that the PTM Foundation takes aim at is trying to give indigenous people a voice because not only do we have so much to learn from them, but they've also been silenced for so much of America's history. Now the foundation, like I said, has only been around a couple years, but they've already done some incredible work in terms of setting up events to raise money for indigenous people, setting up a land awareness pilot with the state of Oregon, and partnering with a number of different indigenous people's tribes and organizations in order for them to discuss topics that are at the forefront of these tribes, while also giving opportunities and grants for people who qualify. And I mean, you love to see it, right? I promise you, if you check out the PCM Foundation, you're going to fall even more in love with this band. And if this is your first time hearing about Portugal, the man or John Gorley, then prepare to fall in love. If you'd like to help or donate to the PTM Foundation, I'll leave a link to the website in the show notes. You can buy a t-shirt like this one and 100% of the profits will go towards these causes. But of course, you can also feel free to just donate straight up if you have enough clothes in your closet. So when you get a chance, please check out the Portugal The Man Foundation. Thank you for listening. And here is the rest of my conversation with John Gorley. I think that with the past two albums, one thing I noticed was that I feel like maybe the themes, I'm not sure if darker is the right word, but they definitely edged towards a more political end of the spectrum. And one of the things I think is really cool about what you guys do is this, you don't just write the, the songs about, you know, political topics, but you're oftentimes pretty active in playing, you know, fundraisers or playing at rallies or voicing your opinions on things that you feel are important. I'm curious to, to learn from you. Why do you think that's important to do as a band? And then also, do you ever have any fears of like polarizing an audience? Oh man, <laughs> I do. I, so I care about that. I do care about that because mm -hmm. I, I think when you're talking about these subjects, like it, I get lit up for this opinion, but yeah, you know, like stop being divisive, you know? I, I think there is 100% totally. right and wrong. Like there just is, but yeah. it can also be this like gray area of it, it's educating people more than anything. Uh, that's, that's all it mm -hmm. is. It's, it's so basic. It's, it's educating people. Like, I don't feel the need to scream at you about things, <laughs> you know, like scream, yeah. scream my opinions and my thoughts to you. I would say that a lot of my thoughts don't come down to opinion. Like it's just how it is. And I think that's why you mm -hmm. speak about it because you're like, well, I, I know this to be wrong. You know, I know mm -hmm. what has happened all over the world around like colonialism, Southern colonialism, like it's has been wrong. And I grew up in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So like I, it's one of the freshest spots. And you can really see the effects of it there. And growing up in the mushing community, like, it's so silly when you go to town. And I, I, mean, I use that word a lot because everything is just kind of ridiculous. Like I know there are people who mean well that don't understand it. That a little nudge, like I mean, what we do at our shows is like it's it's really basic. It's just land acknowledgement and. I equate it to, yeah. You know, if you're going over to your neighbor's house, you knock on the door, like, "Hey, can I come in? Is it is it cool if I come in?" 
it's it's their land and i I think it comes down to like really indigenous knowledge kind of that's that's the way forward to me like a lot of people stepped in and created dust bowls because they didn't heed the warnings like heed the advice like you you need to trust in that and i think we we make a lot of mistakes based on on profit versus just asking questions it's all education like, mm. it's so mm-hmm. strange cuz i'm like, i'm a dropout like i don't i'm not smart i'm not the person you would look to for like any advice on things <laughs> i do have thoughts on things but nobody knows fully what they're talking about it's why there's such a divide like but you'll have some <laughs> yeah some dude some fool working in in a shop going hey a doctor came in today to get their oil changed they don't know what the fuck they're talking about i had to change it he doesn't <laughs> yeah. even know how to change oil like yeah no you know how to yeah. do that and and that's it's a great skill like they both have great skills it's why community exists like why yeah. you know somebody catches the fish somebody cleans the fish somebody prepares the fish somebody presents the fish you know and then somebody cleans up afterwards and we all do this stuff together and i th- i think that's a little bit of what gets lost and i think a lot of what comes from growing up in alaska which is so community based and so like yeah you know, if if you see somebody in the ditch you stop you help them out mm-hmm. that's just, that's just where we come from like we we wave to people and it's not weird like it's it's just normal mm-hmm. to me to be like yo what's <laughs> up do you need help yeah and and let's just say like what what we're doing i think like part of our mantra is you're not doing a good thing you're doing the right thing so like really mm-hmm. keeping your mind out of like what we do is like really basic like, like I, I want to learn too. Like, I want to hear who who is from your area. I think that's cool. Like, mm-hmm. I think it's it's great, and I think it's fun having this like shared learning experience with everybody, without the feelings of like. I mean, it's a very real thing. Like people doing it just because they're like, oh well, this will get us press. Like this will get us something. Like yeah, that's it, that harms everything when you're not looking at like like, do you care to learn more about this i mean even within the the work that we do we make mistakes all the time and Mm -hmm. and it's something like i've i mean it's really given me like an appreciation for all the people that we work around and people that do try to do a lot of this work understanding that it needs to be very focused and it's easy to to think i don't know it's kind of making me think about like other charities like foundations played in the past globally it's very hard to like you're, you're not going to mm-hmm. get much done but when you focus on your community when you focus on the land that you're a part of you can get a lot done and i, th- I think that's like the ultimate goal of foundations but i think with all of this yeah. like, anxiety and-, and where you come from culturally like plays a, a huge factor in it Totally. Very well said. And I, that's something that I try to like, kind of preach on my podcast too, is just like, you don't need to care about every issue because that's exhausting. Like if you cared about everything that's going wrong in the world, you would never get anything done. That would just contribute so much to anxiety. But if you can focus on what can I control and like, how can I impact like my direct community? Like you said, you can get a lot done and it's much better than posting something on Instagram. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't stand social like it's always been really difficult for me but it has been so exhausting it's just so much going on and trying to figure out what's real or not like i i think it's been as long as as long as the internet's been around like you've seen these fake videos get put up where it's like fake reaction to a a prank or like whatever it is like whatever yeah you're watching like over overacting while you're playing games or playing with toys or like whatever it is i think a lot of this stuff is like it's so harmful to look at what everybody else is doing and and think about what everybody else is doing it's really easy to get caught up in it and say maybe what i'm doing isn't good enough 
Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it was one of the Roosevelt said comparison is the thief of joy. I think about that all the time whenever I'm, I'm browsing social media. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question, some questions about anxiety, but uh, before I do that, I did have to ask you because I was watching it's always sunny in Philadelphia last night with my brother. And I was like, I'm talking to John tomorrow. I got to ask what's the origin behind the nightman cover. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you know about our, like, the eternal handshake and all that stuff. We um, did a skit. I'm not sure if I did. a skit with Glenn back uh -huh. around Evil Friends. It, it, we uh -huh. were the fans at the, of that show since it started. We started our band yeah, awesome. on that show at the same time. And, like, we would watch that show in the in the van. Like, when we'd be on tour, we'd be like, watching okay. Always Sunny. Some of our friends here in Portland at Camp Grizzly, Dan Portrait, and Jake Portrait, who plays in Unknown Mortal Orchestra, they've been friends with those dudes awesome band. For, for a while. And I, I just kind of mentioned to them, like, man, I really want to do a promo video or like make a music video with those guys. They're like, oh, let me just introduce you. And they did. And I, I have to say, like, that whole crew is, <laughs> I think it's really funny because I barely know, know them. I would say we've we probably got with Glenn the most. They're all so like their characters. They're like really nice <laughs> versions of their of their characters. Yeah. Which is the best way to make comedy. Like I think comedy really exists yeah. around like Tina Fey was talking about making thirty thirty rock, how they would assign writers to each person to exaggerate their character. So it'd be like mm. you're writing in Tracy Morgan's voice. And it's so, it, it's just how much fun it must be to like write like all the quirks that you see in that person. So it's, so it's natural, and yeah. honest, but it's ridiculous to like over, you know, over the top. Those, yeah. those guys are like that. And I, I think, and Caitlin too, like just really, <laughs> really sweet, really fun, really funny. And after they did it, we were like, God, I really love these people it reminded me so much of the band like they're just like they're friends and it's dysfunctional and the show and they're all like different from what it really is that's Portugal the man Portugal the man's way different behind the scenes than it appears on the surface I mean you see us doing all of the, the foundation work and all this stuff but you don't see us being dipshits at home as much you know <laughs> and I just I, I kind of love that I love that there's like a different thing behind the scenes but yeah they did so much for us like of course we're playing that every night forever music is about those yeah. memories for me like I remember like watching that scene for the first time and like, going this is so funny and Charlie how are you so good at everything <laughs> yeah. and you could just write songs he's like, got a surprisingly good voice oh yeah. he's so good and just, again, kind of knowing what happens behind the scenes, like whenever you see Charlie on the piano, he's playing a different thing every take. He, he's writing a different <laughs> song. He's not repeating the same thing. Like lines aren't always written. And the way they come about is he's freestyling. And that's sick. again, like honesty in the comedy is like, that's, that's where it is for me. Yeah. That's awesome. That, I really appreciate the insight and the behind the scenes because I've watched them quite a bit too. So that's really fun to have those, the stories. So I, I do want to pivot to, to ask you a couple questions about anxiety. Cause that's the, the main theme of the podcast. I know that you mentioned that you grew up and you were pretty shy, but one of the things that I also was familiar with was that you used to play shows with your back to the crowd. I'm just curious, was that rooted in anxiety? And then, if, you know, if not, or if so, like, I guess kind of curious where your, where your struggle from anxiety comes from and if you have any solutions that you discovered for dealing with it. Uh, it's fully anxiety. So when we started out this band, there's been different security blankets along the way. Mm -hmm. I never thought I was going to play in a band. I never thought I was going to sing for a band. If I played in a band, I want to be back there like somewhere. Like yeah. in the shadows. When I started playing music, I kind of got into it. I realized I didn't want to be on stage. So like I just really like writing music. So like maybe I want to produce music. Maybe I want to do this. But there was a part of me that as soon as I sat down to do it, I was like, well, I'm not really good enough at that. I don't really, 
have the technical mind to EQ mm -hmm. and like do all the things that you need to do. I have the ears for it, but there's there's a technical side to, to production, to me anyway, that it takes like some of that foresight and understanding of how to like get things sounding right. That was not for me. So I started writing and I would just write songs at home. I would record on Cakewalk on my little desktop computer, just try to figure it out. And I, I started making these demos. And the goal was to look for a singer. The, the goal was I'm, I'm gonna write these songs and I'm gonna try to find a singer. And I started making these demos and my friends were like, hey, these sound really good. Like, this is this is really cool. I'd be like, okay, cool. Well, I don't really want to do it. So I'm going to send them out to labels and, and see if I can, like, get a label who wants to talk to me about writing music or whatever. I sent out all these CDs. I sent some, there were, like, some hip-hop labels. There were some, like, punk labels and things. I just kind of, like, put them out there. I got a call back from one of the, the oddly, it was like, it was a hip hop label. And this, this dude, he, he was so funny. Like, he was just so stoked. He's like, you're, you're from Alaska? That's crazy. That's crazy. I really want to put out this music. And he, he's talking about, we talked a few times and he's like, I want to sign you. Like, I, 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 want, I want to sign you guys. I'm like, oh, cool. And he's, he's saying you guys, and I think he's assuming that it's a band. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> like, whatever. Like, yeah. nice guys. Like, yeah. the third or fourth time we talk, he goes, so when am I going to get to talk to the, the girl who sings for the band? And I was like, <laughs> uh, I didn't say anything. I was just like, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe I could connect you guys. And then I just never <laughs> talked to him again. And I was like, oh my God, I gotta stop doing this. Like, why would I put my voice on it? You're so stupid. Like, uh, just all the like negative yeah. things you could possibly say to yourself. That was my start in music <laughs> was, I knew I had something because people wanted it, wanted to sign it. And I knew that like, this is just something that I, I wanna do. You know, you, you kind of like, you see things and you, you, that, that's a major part of, of creative roles in anything is, knowing that this is a thing it's it's not in mm -hmm. in this box like it's it's out here there are no rules like that's a mentality that's like it's very very necessary to to any sort of creativity is it's whatever you want it to be like go go and do it mm -hmm. but if you think that i should be singing for this you're wrong <laughs> so i i think yeah. after that point i i kind of took a step back was like shit i gotta find a singer i gotta find a girl who can sing this stuff and who wants to sing it and to be better than me anyway like i i shouldn't be doing that in the meantime while i'm looking for a singer one of my friends hits me up my girlfriend had just dumped me she left me for somebody else living in alaska i'm just all alone like my my friend group has spiraled into addiction and this is at like 18, mm -hmm. 19. They're all like, mm -hmm. it, it was really bad. Like the area I, I, I was mm -hmm. kind of like in was really bad. I had just taken a step back from all of them because I was saying, oh, the, like you can easily get lost in this. And I, mm -hmm. I have this thing that I want to do and I'm, I'm happy sitting at home on my computer and writing and trolling message boards. During that time, some Zach and some friends hit me up. And, and they were like, yeah, I want mm -hmm. you to come and sing for our band and write songs. I don't think they really wanted that. I think they just wanted the songs that I had demoed, which th we did mm -hmm. one of them. And the rest of them just didn't fit the band. So I come down to Portland. I come down to Portland to, to join this band. I'm singing for them. We take some of the songs. There's a lot of compromise around it. And it, that's something I realized right away i mean a kid with anxiety like <laughs> having to compromise <laughs> on anything that's part of the anxiety yeah you no know, it's got to be a yeah. way. it's got to be like this that band imploded yeah because why wouldn't it like my, the songs that i'm writing are changing to fit like what you guys want to do why don't i just do the thing that i want to do mm. so when, when that fell apart it was just 
again, I tried to find a singer. Dude, I've been trying to find a singer for this band up until... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would get a singer today. And, and you know, you know what's really <laughs> crazy? Like, I don't think it would matter. And this is, again, they're like, there, there are no rules to this. I guarantee if I got somebody to sing for this band and just sat with them and was like, okay, they can do it. They could go out and play these shows and it would be fine as an audience member. I'm not necessary to this. And that's that's one of the things I think has been <laughs> really impossible to explain to anybody else. But I know it. I know that to be true. I, 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 I do not believe you if you if you tell me that it matters because it, it, it doesn't. I, I'm not necessary to this. I've never written anything. I've never done any of this like it's it's all it's all just been bits and pieces that float by and you write it down and you put it out there but you're not doing it like i'm not doing it yeah well i mean john i hate to disagree with you after just saying that you won't believe me if i do but i do disagree with you man i mean like you're i feel like your your voice is pretty unique like it's distinct when I heard Feel It Still for the first time, it wasn't, I just like acute, it came on the radio and I was like, oh, this Portugal man it has to be. So like, I, I don't know, man, I, I feel like there is an aspect of like all art that's like, there's a detached sense of it, you know, where it's like, yeah, we're all the same thing. We're all made of the same stuff and we're all building off each other. So nothing's truly original, but there also is like a part of it where it's like, it kind of has to enter the, your own filter and come out, I come out in a certain way. And I don't know, I think your stuff, I mean, you and Zach have been in the band forever, but and it kind of has your fingerprints all over it in a lot of ways. But I do respect the humility. I think the humility is really cool. <laughs> okay, well, I will say, I'll, I'll say this. Yeah, no, yeah. The records would have to come through this, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I wish it sounded like, I wanted to sound like long, long, long. I wanted to sound like the, the White Album. I want to sound like Cry Baby Cry. Like, I want it to sound like this. But it doesn't, because this is mm -hmm. the way my voice sounds. Mm -hmm. And... I may not like the sound of it. <laughs> I may not fully appreciate what what it is, but I, I I will say it's it's once it leaves that like once it leaves that zone of like it comes through the filter for sure. But you could go out live, and it, I don't think it would matter because you're you're doing things that are totally different. The feel can be different, and that's so much of what it is in the studio. Is just I just like being the the filter i just like being like oh wow there's this thing that's that's floating by right now let's put that on here let's get let's get that done i exist in that world and dude a huge reason it's taken us so long to make the last two albums is i can be in the studio as long as i want and it's my favorite thing in the world and i can throw away hundreds and hundreds of songs along this like, <laughs> years long stretch and go Man, I'm just filling up my bucket constantly. I don't really care about the other side of things, which is like, oh, do you want to hear it? <laughs> do you, would you like to hear what I'm working on? I don't care about that. Like, I just, yeah. I just like making it and being like, wow, that was like a really fun chord progression. That like really got me going in the moment. So it's, it's finding like meaning behind what you're doing. Woodstock had right. a lot of meaning to me in getting it done but mm -hmm. i think three songs of that record I, I don't need a name um wait let me see is it three songs i think it's three songs on that that album should not have been on that album not in the way they were presented they, it was it was too fast like they got produced too mm -hmm. fast and i think it would put the whole album in a different context if, if it had been recorded the way it was meant to be, which was orchestra, live, like go into a studio and record these, like there were three songs that just needed to be done a little bit differently. And they were, oh, it was four songs. Okay, and they were very successful songs for us. Feel It Still is not one of them. Feel It Still is like one of the most natural to us there is, I think, but when it's, yeah. when it's bookended and when it's sandwiched between songs that have a different feel to it, it puts it in a, into a context that it should have never been. Not to mm -hmm. 
talk about Woodstock that way. I'm, I'm saying that like going forward, I was like, what what was missing in that? The reason I wanted to create it is because I wanted to hear what Woodstock would sound like then. You know, how do you apply yeah. like all this like Motown stuff in, in a way that makes sense today? It clearly worked really well, but it also sets up these like pressures and these like, <laughs> yo, did I really set the bar that high? Like I wasn't trying to do that. Like I was just trying to like, <laughs> Yeah. do the thing and but you have to do it knowing what it is i mean i knew what feel it still yeah. was the second i played it and and there's an interesting thing like i i mean i had that song for years i think everybody knows that at this point i had it for five years before, mm-hmm. before this i had a friend come to me and say it's something i really respect it says you know i remember when you wrote that and I remember when you said it should be to the melody of Mr. Postman. And I said, no, that will never work. And I said, well, I got to keep it then. Like, I got to ho- hold on to it because this is like where creativity and that anxiety, all this stuff lives is in the space where it's going. I was self-conscious, too self-conscious mm-hmm. to say like, no, that's what it is. Let's do it. But I, I yeah. think in the timeline of things, I also look back and I go, yeah, I also wasn't ready to, to be born then. Mm. It wasn't it wasn't fully realized. It took it took Asa to Kony and like that energy in the room. It just be the energy in the room that helps bring it out. Like Asa being stoked. Like he was so stoked when I He's playing the bass line and he's just sitting in the room and we're in the lounge while we're mixing them in the moment in the other room. And Ace is just like, yo, Jay, what is that? And I'm like, oh, it's just, mm-hmm. it's just a stupid bass line. It's not a stupid bass line. I know what it is. Like, I've been playing this bass line forever. Yeah. Like, I love this bass line. Yeah. Can I record that real quick? Yeah, of course. You got a verse? Well, I, I kind of have this, you know, and I kind of like rattle off a little bit. You have a chorus? I mean, I do have this. It is the the you know I self consciously go. Well, it's it's Mr. Yeah. Postman, but you know this. I'll put it on as a yeah. placeholder. Do you have a bridge? I say, well, I don't, but I have these chords, and I I kind of like put on these different chords. It, it all it all came through so quickly. I I guess I'm really getting at like where the anxiety and the creativity and all this stuff like like what it is it's it's taking this thing that's coming through filtering it and the excitement in the room was the most important part to getting it done was having a supportive friend there just saying oh my god what else you got write a bridge is it coming is it coming as soon as you said is it coming i went well, it's a middle eight, obviously. Like that's a little bit louder now, a little bit louder now, a little bit softer now, a little bit softer. Yeah. Now. It's Isley Brothers. Like, yeah, it, it's just hearing yeah. that all that stuff. It's it's going through this filter of like memories and emotions and senses, and it's going. Asa, wow, you hit something that's so great. I'm definitely not writing on this right now, because if we try to write on this anymore, it's gonna find the wrong thing and i gotta stay in that memory so stepping away from it like it was a strange thing hearing all these things and knowing what needed to happen i knew it needed that guitar line on it <laughs> i mean mm-hmm. i know this now for like being around songwriters so it's a secondary melodic hook yeah there it's necessary when you're writing a song but it's intuition you know like it was like intuitive like, i yeah. i was just like well it needs this like it it needs like this little lick that takes you out of it for a second and gives you another little piece of candy. The chorus is different every time it's sung. And it's something that like, yeah, that's knowing Motown. That's, that's live takes. We, we need to stop like building blocks, like the building block thing, like flying the chorus and copying the chorus. is not really what needs to happen. It, it flies right by you. Like you don't notice that it's different unless you're mm-hmm. working on it directly. Like people don't notice it's different. But that, that was also a danger mouse yeah. suggestion. He's like, oh, you should say something ah. different right here. I'm like, well, what if I said 
like this. He's like, yeah. Yeah. And then you finish the song. Can I just tell you how cool that dude is? Like, he's so smart. <laughs> yeah, he's, please. He has so much style, so much... When you're talking about, like, intuitive writing, and this guy is... It's all soul. It's all emotion. It's all that fiery, artistic thing. You can't really put your finger on it. When he has something, he has something. Like, I, I'll sit here and yeah. bubble around all day long and be like, is this it? Is this it? When... When he hums something in your ear, or when he like says like, "Yo, let me let me give you something. Let me give you an idea." It's it's always right, and what he offers you is like, "Well, can you beat it?" And it's this like friendly competition where it's like, "Wow, that's so inspiring that you think I can beat this melody that you just hummed. That's perfect." Yeah, I, I think I think that's just it's such an amazing thing when you see people who have that and have that ability to tap into it so freely, and also process yeah. it. Like those those are two different things. Those are two different types of people. Totally, the person that can process it is typically the producer, and they're not necessarily getting that signal. They're not getting that like catching the thing floating by. You know, they'll they'll say things here and there. Yeah. But it's, not always perfect and I, I i think that's one thing about brian that i've always really respected he heard that and feel it still and still was like i mean i talked to him about it i was like i was like hey i gotta give you writing credit on this he's like i didn't write anything like, well you did more than not write <laughs> that's for sure yeah and yeah it's like no that like you had that like you you already knew what to do it's it's really interesting when you're around people like that who who can be so supportive i mean emotionally supportive like artistically supportive yeah and and also like really yeah, he helped write that song he may, he may not yeah. get credit for it but this is also my anxiety. If I were on the other side of it, I'd be like, yeah, dude, that's awesome that you would try to give me credit for that. I'd probably do the same thing, though. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. I write that. Like, you had it. Yeah. It's, it's those teachings, those little, like, lessons along the way that I think are really, I mean, that's my favorite part of, of music. Your story about Asa being in the room. First of all, I love electric guests. So that's a really cool story. Every time they come to LA, I'm front row. But when you were talking about the beginning of our conversation about the one really important piece to sharing music is the excitement. It's cool. Cause like you talked about, you had played feel it still years ago and some guy was like, that's not it. But then Asa comes in and he's like, what is that? Like, keep playing it. And then all of a sudden you have, you know, a hit song. It just kind of speaks to that, uh, the way that, that music works sometimes in that regard. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it is. It's 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 fully the people in the room. It's fully like hearing like somebody wants it to get out. I mean, that's that was a, a huge part of the the new record to go into some of that. I had some pretty intense things happen recently with my job. My my job was like busted, and I went through this period of well, this is broken. It's not going to work. I mean, I was, I was literally breaking. I was just like splitting teeth. It just like my, my jaw was like clenching together and it was touching in one spot and just smashing teeth, like one after the other. Yes. To the point where like, I got I had COVID at one point. I was like, oh, I'm <laughs> throwing up, I'm sick, I have fevers. I, I remember sitting in LA and taking tests for two weeks, multiple tests. They're all negative. I'm sitting there, I'm going, I have all this jaw pain anyway. And I'm down there, I'm going to try to write. I'm going to try to get some things going because I'm in this like severe depression because I can't, I didn't think I was ever going to be able to sing again. I, I could barely talk yeah. during this period. But to have, I think I have COVID. I'm like, well, my, I think it might be my tooth that hurts. I ended up waking up one morning and driving back to Portland. My tooth had been split <laughs> all the way down. And, the and everything was coming from this, like, pain. But because my jaw was in so much pain, I couldn't even tell that my tooth was split. It, that was, like, my, like, reason. Yeah. Like, okay, this is, this is pretty bad if I can't 
tell that a tooth is like split. But going through all that, struggling with all that, I, I feel bad for doing it, but I had to go back and be like, I, I'm, I need to write an album about this anxiety that I've, I've been feeling. Mm. The new album is about anxiety and so anxiety is around like community and like the family you create and accountability and kind of just realizing like in that moment, thinking like, man, I haven't done things right. Like I've fucked up. Like I've like, I, I think it's about like, never do that again. You know, it's about that. Like you yeah. kind of have to look at life and I, I wanted to write about that. Like, why are we fighting about the wrong things? Like, this is me the whole time. Like, like I, yeah. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do this again. I have doubts. I have anxiety. I'm worried about the future. I'm worried about my daughter. I'm worried about these things. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been able to write another album that was just a collection of songs. I, I've never written a concept album, but we, we did. And it all came out of this like mm -hmm. extreme pain and this I mean, feeling like, like what is happening? What is happening in the world? What is happening in my house? Like what, what is going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I finally did it in a way that is very representative of me. And I didn't think I'd ever be able to do it, but that's what anxiety does, I guess. It makes you doubt. It makes you like overthink. It makes you do all these things. But at the same time, on the other side of it, being very aware of the variables in a situation makes you more in tune with how to read a room and observe and take a step back. And I think embracing the anxiety is something I ended up mm. doing somewhere along the way. I mean, Love that. I, I definitely had yeah. it. And there was a, a point where it, it's still there. I mean, but I, I think you have to trust it and listen to it and and hear what it's telling you and not not be afraid of it i think that's incredible advice and probably a great a great way to close th this conversation out i did want to give you the best advice i ever heard about anxiety it came from a very unlikely source a couple months ago i just quit my job and i was working on a book of the book that i'm trying to write and i was just like really struggling with it T terrible anxiety so i needed to take a walk and I was like, I was smoking like a cigarette, which like, I don't even smoke cigarettes. So I don't know why I had one, but this guy who I'm like convinced is homeless. I'm not sure I've seen him around my neighborhood. I know he has a car, but I'm pretty sure he's homeless. He's like the setup outside. Like he always sets up like these lawn chairs and he's like, Hey, do you, you look like you're stressed. Do you want to sit down for a sec? He's like this native American dude, like really long hair. He's like all these native American stuff around him. I was like, sure. So I sat down and he was just talking to me about it. I shared a little bit about my podcast and anxiety I was feeling. He's like, just do an exercise with me. And he like made me close my eyes and just like sit in silence with him for like five minutes. And I was just kind of waiting for like him to say anything, but he didn't say anything at all. He's just like, I just want you to know, as you're going to create your art and moving forward, it should all be from this place of just like being tranquil and still and free from distractions, free from concerns. And uh, I was like, that was pretty, that was pretty good advice. I didn't expect that to him to say anything like that. But since then I've really applied it and it's been immensely helpful for me. So I'm not sure if that does anything for you, but oh, no, definitely. Yeah, it was really cool, cool that experience. Tuned in, into that. that. Yeah. Again, like that anxiety and all of that comes from a place of observation. And I mean, that's what it is. A, a, a lot of that stuff to me, like your anxieties are like, what if, what if, what if, what if, yeah. And I, I think that's yeah. a, a great quality to have because what if you know just try yeah. to use it in a positive way like that, <laughs> that's the yeah that's the difficult that's the tightrope walk that's the don't yeah. fall on either side because like as long as you stay on the path and you can't keep your eye on the prize man like that's that's what it is like, <laughs> all of this stuff telling yeah. you what if should be telling you like okay well let me just do this to make sure like if that happens i have this if this happens, then I have that. And like, kind of, every time I think about anything, it's like that. 
there's little charts pop up where it's just like <laughs> it leads to this little bubble and then <laughs> yeah. 10 other things offshooting from that it's like well if that happens then you have all of this if it's if it's yes if it's yeah no, you know and then you, yeah. you go down the <laughs> the list the it's, tree. it's all about yeah. processing it so the the person that stopped you is just somebody who sees it you know and i i again it's a, it's a really powerful thing to see it and it's a really powerful thing to understand it it's a really powerful thing to have it mm -hmm. it, 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 it makes it. everything function anxiety makes the world function hmm. John, I think that's the most optimistic take on anxiety we've had on the show so far. So I really appreciate you sharing your insights and dude, it's just so stoked to have you. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Hope you did too. We'll really appreciate you, you stopping by. What can we expect next from you? If, we, if we're trying to stay in tune with what's happening with Portugal, the man, how can we, how can we stay in touch? Well, we have PTM foundation, Portugal, the man foundation. And we're always kind of doing things there. I think we're just getting ready to release new music. Anxiety has Hell yeah. <laughs> putting it out, but yeah. it's ready. I know it's ready and it's, it's really exciting and really, uh, a piece of me. So trying to get everything, I'm just trying to get everything in line for it artwork and things like that i haven't done all of that stuff for a long time and i'm really excited to do it all right well awesome man thank you so much again for stopping by if pain was a color to paint on you your heart would be the color blue be a gradient from there until your body met your head which remained a silver you are the one they call jesus christ is there to say that hasn't already been said at the beginning of this podcast i complimented john on how humble and cool he was but you know i just wanted to take a moment to just tell you how cool you are having conversations with these extraordinary people has become one of my favorite things in the world to do but i wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for you so i just wanted to say thank you so much for listening hearing that you like the show makes me really happy but hearing that you have applied the things that you've learned on the show to live a more anxiety free and fulfilling life is it's just the best that's all it is it's just the best so once again thank you so much for listening if you want to stay in the loop on future episodes of the podcast you can feel free to follow me on instagram at here's johnny nava nava although you can also follow me on other forms of social media at here's johnny nava as well and once again i would love to encourage you to check out the ptm foundation when you get a chance it is, in my opinion, one of the coolest nonprofits out there, and it is definitely worthy of your attention. Until next time, I'm Johnny Nava, and here's to you. Thanks. Man, oh man, you think it's so American.